Thank you so much for being here today. I mean, there are lots of fun things out there. Hollywood actors dressed up like Ottoman, you know, sultans and so on. So you preferred coming here. Thank you for that. And thanks for the Pacifica Institute actually for organizing this event and for, for hosting me here today for the second talk. You know, we had another one, another discussion yesterday about Turkey. Now this time I'll go more into my book. And thanks to Sophia a lot uh, for really for this very generous introduction and like uh, not just into my book but also into my life uh, and but I just you know Sophia you already ex like uh, used two basic stories that I start to you know use to begin a, a conference like this <laughs> so I'll try to begin with something else something different um, and let me begin with an interesting story actually another interesting story uh, which I also shared yesterday but we have a new audience here today uh, the first time I came to the United States, it was some 13 years ago, uh, and I came to a conference, like as, as I always come to, you know, you, the, the main reason I come to U.S. is mainly conferences. And uh, a friend of mine who used to live in the country, he, here in the U.S., so I was hungry, and we were hungry, and we, were, we needed breakfast at an airport. He said, well, let's have breakfast at McDonald's. And I said, like, do we really want to eat burgers and, you know, breakfast? He said, no, no, McDonald's gives different, proper breakfast. I said, okay, what is that? S then we went there and we take this big, m some standard menu for breakfast, I don't know its name, but there was pancakes in it. And that was the first time that I saw and tasted pancakes. And I simply fell in love with pancakes. I said, this is the greatest thing ever. Well, I have nev never eaten this before. And uh, so the next time I come to the States, I was desperately hoping to eat pancakes again. But I thought, Pancakes was an exclusive McDonald's product. <laughs> so, so, the, the, so for the first few days, I again looked for a McDonald's before 10.30 to find the pancake. But then I was in New York City then, and I was walking and I saw a restaurant saying pancakes. I said, ah, they stole the idea from McDonald's and they copied it everywhere. <laughs> Later on, I learned, you know, that pancakes are a larger phenomenon. I know, I've even tasted homemade pancakes, which were better than everything. Uh, so, I, and I think that's a, just, that's my silliness, a little story there, back there. But I think it shows that a, a culture, when you first face it, uh, can be sometimes misleading. At least you might not f fully grasp the, the realities of a culture. And uh, the mis misperception about the origin of pancakes is, is, is a minor, minor issue. It's really not important. And you figure it out easily. You know, it just takes a, it takes a little walk in a city to see that you're mistaken there. But, uh, but mistake, mistakes or misunderstandings about the values of a culture, about the history or the practices of a religion particularly, is, is, uh, is, is more serious. And, and it's sometimes harder to you know, overcome those misperceptions. And I would say, I think, uh, in the Western world today, there is an understandable and justified concern about some of the radical elements within the Muslim civilization, uh, some angry Muslims who have done some horrible things, uh, such as the 9-11 attacks, which you know, Muslims throughout the world have denounced as something uh, an unspeakable speakable, speakable crime against innocent people, and it's a crime that you know, puts stain on our faith. Uh, but that really is not, you know, uh, what what the majority of Muslims believe and think that that is the true values of our faith. Uh, and that really doesn't represent the 14th century long history of a whole civiliza civilization, a Muslim civilization. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, if we leave that issue of terrorism aside, which uh, which is very marginal, I mean, a sympathy for terrorist acts such such as that, is is very very marginal. Any support for that in the Muslim world. But there are issues in, there are broader issues. There are some broader problems. And some of these problems are, uh, the problems that I try to discuss in my book, try to deconstruct in my book, and try to understand where they come from. These are the problems about an authoritarian approach to some religious questions. And, uh, you know, Sophia's, you know, summarized it well. Is it music out there? It's, it's fine, yeah, we can do nothing about it, so. Okay, oh, oh, yes, sorry. I didn't hear it, sorry. It's, 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 it's called a prayer. Uh, as Sophia uh, summarized, one 
story, which was actually striking for me, was a passage that I read uh, when I was at the age of nine, uh, a passage which said, when your children don't start to pray, you know, beat them uh, and make, them sh make sure that they pray. And uh, when I was a kid, I saw that, and uh, that made me nervous, you know, way back. But uh, even then, I had noticed that it was not a passage from the Quran. It was not a verse, but it was something else, some other part, some other aspect of the Islamic tradition. Uh, and I think that that insight is important to keep in mind because Islam, like other monotheistic uh, religions, Islam, like other religions with a scripture, uh, began with a revealed text, a text that Muslims believe it's revealed, and I believe it's revealed, uh, like Christians b believe that Jesus Christ spoke the word of God, or Jews believe that the Torah brought the commandments of God. Then that text was understood by people and it unfolded in history and was understood and interpreted in various ways. And throughout this process, many customs, pre-existing customs, attitudes, mindsets became mixed with religion. Uh, this is in many ways normal. I mean, if, if people understand a text, you know, they, they, a divine text, they get inspired by it, but they sometimes keep on living as they are. And this is, un this is only natural. But it becomes a problem when we uh, uh, attach ourselves to some medieval customs, although they are not necessarily Islamic, but, and try to preserve them today, thinking that we are preserving something really Islamic. Now, one horrible example of this, for example, yeah, you're welcome, sir. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, one example of, of this, for example, this confusion of tradition, tradition of men, you know, as Jesus said in the New Testament, with the, with the word of God, that confusion is, for example, a practice that is unknown in Turkey, that is unknown in most parts of the Muslim world, but is very popular, unfortunately, in Northeast Africa, called female genital mutilation. Uh, it's a horrible practice, very painful, and and totally, uh, totally wrong. You know, just to cut cut somebody's, you know, body and take an organ off. It's uh, and w what is important is that for Muslims who practice this in North Africa think that this is religiously justified, but if you look at the Quran, there is no uh, reference for that uh, ever. And actually, in the Quran, there are verses which says. God's creation should not be changed by men. In other words, you should not really you know, change people's biology because God created it that way. Uh, and uh, when you look at other, again, Muslim uh, cultures and societies, you don't see that. What's more important is that in the same area, Northeast Africa, if you go and see who's doing this, well, there are Muslim communities, but there are also other communities like the animists even some Christians in Ethiopia were practicing the same thing until very recently. Even a Jewish tribe in North Africa is known to have you know, practiced female genital mutilation for quite, uh, for quite until recently. So apparently there is a custom in the area which people think it's the right thing to do because it's their tradition and that became, becomes mixed with religion but ultimately it's not religious. And it is easy to see that when you look at an example like female genital mutilation because it's really not in any, any basic Islamic text and it's unknown in most parts of the Muslim world. But are there other attitudes you know, in, in uh, contemporary Muslim cultures which Muslims think is a you know, commandment of Islam but are actually cultural attitudes, historical attitudes, or interpretations of Islam based on a particular context? And that is also important because uh, Islamic law began, you know, right after the Quran as Muslims, it, Islamic law was created, you know, uh, gradually by medieval scholars, and they look at the Quran and the practices of Prophet Muhammad, but they also thought in their own time and milieu. They look at the world, they saw a basic, you know, reality, and they tried to interpret Islam according to that reality. For example, the famous division between house of war and House of Islam, those two ter terms. I mean, if you start to discuss Islam and politics, these are the terms that you will come up e eventually. Uh, medieval scholars thought that you know, the world should be divided into House of Islam, uh, the, the, you know, the home of Islam, if you will, which is you know, uh, lands governed by Muslims according to Islamic law, and the House of War, which is enemy territory, like hostile territory. But this was probably understandable in the medieval world because in the medieval world, there was no international law 
There was no international norm of human rights, and there was no uh, institutionalized you know, legal structures. There was no United Nations, there was no media. So a Muslim who left the Muslim lands and who went to Christian Europe would probably face per per persecution there. And actually they did face persecution you know, in, in Christian Europe. Even Jews faced persecution, for example, in Christian Europe. And the other way around, you know, and, and if Muslims went to some any non-Muslim territory, they would feel insecure. But today, the world is quite changed. And actually, many Muslims feel much safer in some of the non-Muslim majority countries, such as the United States, in, than in their homelands. That's why many people, many pious Muslims who are persecuted in their home countries, come to the United States to find religious freedom. So keeping that medieval notion of division, house of war, house of Islam, which doesn't exist in the Quran, which was an interpretation of the medieval reality by medieval scholars, cannot be brought into today. Uh, and it, it wouldn't mean the same thing. And I would say even then, even in the medieval era, some scholars created actually a third category uh, called the house of treaty, in which if a Muslim state makes a treaty with a you know, non-Muslim state, say Byzantium, on the security and safety of you know, Muslims, then that would be considered separately. That would not be considered a house of war. So in today's world, I think every, except a few countries like North Korea or, you know, uh, and today Syria, I would say, like some countries which really persecute their own people without any inter referring to any international norms of justice, they would be considered a peace, you know, house of treaty rather than house of war. But even then, I think those concepts would need to be revised and maybe not, uh, not uh, considered relevant for today. Now, there are other questions that comes to mind, you know, uh, in, uh, when we question about the issue of authoritarianism or, or uh, like, illiberalism and, and, and in the Muslim world. And let me also, if we speak about, especially in political terms, let me begin with an observation. And this observation was made by many political scientists after 9-11. Uh, the Middle East doesn't have too many democracies. It actually has only a few. I mean, Turkey is there. There's Israel, of course, is a different case. Uh, but Arab countries have not been democratic for a long time. And uh, if, if we speak before, for the Arab, speak about the Arab world before the Arab Spring, you would see a very undemocratic, you know, a piece of the, uh, piece of the world. Now, looking at that, some people in the United States have said, "Hmm, the Arabic Middle East is not democratic." The Arabic Middle East is Islamic. So Islam doesn't produce democracies. So Islam is, an, in other words, an obstacle to democracies. W why would be the reason? But actually, when you look at the authoritarian uh, dictatorships in the Muslim, wor uh, Muslim world, the Arab world, most of them are actually secular dictatorships. They're not, uh, in other words, justifying themselves out of Islam. They're justifying themselves out of nationalism or just out of simply power. For example, the Syrian dicta the S dictatorship in Syria, the, the, that of Mubarak in Egypt, which has actually you know, just went down with the Arab Spring, the one in Tunisia, uh, and Gaddafi, these were not regimes, theocratic regimes, which justified themselves you know, uh, via Islam. Quite the contrary, there were authoritarian regimes sometimes which suppressed Islamic groups and actually mo made those Islamic groups, some of them more and more strident, and ultimately you know, created some terrorist offshoots from those movements. So maybe there are problems in the region which are about political culture in general, and, and, the sec and being secular doesn't mean that you become a liberal and democratic, uh, like an actor, political actor. So maybe there are, we have to look at the political problems and the political culture problems in the region rather than accusing Islam. You know. This can be said generally, if, I think, for the uh, political, uh, political issue of liberty. And when we look at Turkey, for example, countries like Turkey, I tried to explain that a bit more deeply yesterday. Uh, in Turkey, we have always had a, like a very se more secular segment of the society uh, and a more pious segment of the society. And the secular Turks, secularists maybe I would say, have always considered themselves more open-minded, more, more liberal and more progressive. You know? The others wear the headscarf and you know, they look more pre-modern, whereas the people who live more you know, in a more Western lifestyle so were supposed to be more democratic and liberal. But in the past 10 years, we saw that the Turks who resisted reforms, reforms for minority rights, reforms for individual freedom, reforms for Kurds or reforms for non-Muslims came more from the secular camp rather than the, the more from the Islamic-minded camp. 
perhaps then the problem there's nothing which makes a religious mind more you know inherently uh, less democratic or less liberal than and then a secular mind um, so these are i think some of the basic observations you know that we we should face first of all before discussing islam and liberty in other words we should see that maybe there are societies in which individual freedom has not been advanced enough uh, and the pious of those societies are maybe influence of that maybe illiberal political culture but the issue is not whether they're pious or not the issue is whether you can liberalize the political culture now in the book i try to you know unravel some of these issues and try to show where you know uh, where authoritarianism comes from i also try to show where from which Islamic sources, a more, an argument for a more liberal attitude, a more liberal culture can be built. And I did this by basically going back to some of the early debates in Islam, which are very interesting uh, when you look at from a, uh, from a per perspective in search of liber uh, liberty. For example, one of the early debates in Islam was on the question of which Islamic camp had, had the ultimate access to uh, truth. What the earliest uh, political uh, friction in Islam was between the uh, proponents of uh, Ali, uh, the fourth caliph, and the proponents of Muawiyah, the governor of Syria. So this is known as the biggest divide between, this, the beginning of the divide between the Sunni and Shiite worlds. This was a big w war between the two sides. Now, both sides disagreed on who would be would, would the caliph. But there was another camp, a third camp, a very fanatical camp, who said, well, since you guys dispute, both of you are wrong, and because you are, they, they use the re particular reasoning to condemn them. And they said, since both you are wrong, we condemn you because you have become apostates, and we even have the right to kill you because that, you know, you, you have erred. This group called the Kharijites is the first fanatic radical movement in Islamic history. They are, if you will, the terrorists of the uh, seven, seventh, eighth century, you know, uh, Islamic world. They were very marginal, but they sat on killing, you know, fellow Muslims because they thought that only they had the right version of Islam, and others who had the wrong version of Islam deserve to be, you know, punished. Now, this is obviously a very illiberal, anti-democratic mindset, and you know, this can only breed violence and authoritarianism, that kind of mindset. But there was a the opposing camp to the. Um, uh, to these Harijites, these dissenters, uh, as they're called in English, these were the people who are called the postponers in English. Uh, postponers, murjiite in Arabic. And the postponers were called postponers because they said this. They said, well, instead of deciding who's right and wrong, ultimately, why don't we leave this decision to God to be resolved in afterlife? And they actually referred to a particular verse in the Quran which says, it is God who will decide among you for the things that you have differed uh, amongst you. Uh, he will decide it in the afterlife. So since they decided to postpone this, and they, they created this uh, space in which everyone can live and understand Islam in the way they deem fit. And so they, they created the basis for religious pluralism. Uh, and that, that argument of the Murjais, the postponers, influenced Abu Hanifa, the, uh, one of the founders of four uh, major Islamic schools, and that's, that's one of the reasons that the Hanafi tradition has been a bit more flexible than some, some other Sunni schools. Uh, and it is particularly interesting that I think the same argument for pluralism was made by British liberal thinker John Locke a thousand years after the postponers. In his letter concerning toleration, he wrote, well, there are many churches in England. Only God knows which one is ultimately right. So why don't we have a pluralist system in which, you know, each of them, why don't we accept liberty for all under which, you know, everybody can live peacefully? Uh, there are other parallelism. I mean, Muslim, some of the thinkers in the, in the medieval Muslim world discussed the idea of freedom. And the idea of freedom basically came from the insight that every Muslim is giving a test in life which will be ultimately decided and quest questioned and decided by God in the afterlife. Uh, because the Quran tells that every individual has a life and a responsibility, and it's a personal responsibility. As a Muslim, I cannot expect someone else to save me. I, I should have my own, you know, my deeds and my, and my own inner feelings and my own goodwill to be saved in afterlife. So in order to be able to give this test, I should be able to make choices. 
And based on that reasoning, Islamic some Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages, and I uh, touch upon them in the book, said that making religious choices and an environment which allows that is a must, you know, for the evolution, for the flourishing of a genuine piety. Uh, and I think it is only common sense to see this today. Since Sophia began with the, you know, my, my experience in Saudi Arabia, I want to finish with that. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, you know, well, there's this interesting phenomenon that, you know, only Kaaba is not segregated, but all other spaces are segregated, like a gender, they have gender segregation. There's another I interesting phenomenon in Saudi Arabia called the religious police, the mutawa. Uh, and these are Saudi employed, you know, morality police, and their job is to go around, and they have sticks in their hands sometimes, and they would force people to observe what they perceive as Islamic law. Uh, and they would enforce people to observe all Islamic practices. For example, when the prayer time comes, and if you're messing around, the religious police will come and tell you, go to the mosque, go to the mosque. And they would also force your shop to, you know, it would force you to close your shop because at the prayer time, you are supposed to keep your shop closed. Now, here's the question that I asked to some of my friends from Saudi Arabia who are a little more positive about this, you know, experience. If you're going to the mosque, because of police is forcing you to go. Is this really worshiping God? Great. Shouldn't you go to the mosque, not because you fear the police, but you fear God and you love God? I think that's the fundamental issue that you know Muslims, uh, authoritarian-minded Muslims, now of course many Muslims do not think like the Saudis in the perspective, the authoritarian Muslims have to face in order to have a genuine piety in the heart of every individual, the only thing you can do is to share your faith, to preach your faith. Uh, but if they want to do something else, you, can, you should only respect them. Because if you enforce anything on them, what you're trying to do is not creating any genuine piety. You are only creating hypocrisy. And that's again, we see, that's something we see in examples like in Saudi Arabia. In Turkey, it's famous that, you know, sometimes the Iranians and Saudis who can't find alcohol in their countries will come to Istanbul or London or Europe and party on light long, you know, with their, in the most craziest fashion. And when they go back, they appear pious. Uh, now, that appearance of piety might be helpful for, for the Saudi regime politically because the Saudi regime basically says, we are, we have the right to rule because you see, we are making everybody good Muslims. And when you look from a point of view, according to, their, um, according to the Islamic law, they understand, it's a very ordered, pious society. But what, what does it matter if they're doing this because they you know, fear the police and why if they are doing this? And if they're not doing this for the sake of God, why is that important and why is that valuable anyway? So I think that's why in the book, I've looked at all the authoritarian elements uh, in Islamic law. And I, I, first, I try to show that they are not actually even Quranic. They are either interpretations of the Quran or come from a particular context like the ban on apostasy. Uh, and today, I think Muslims should ask for freedom first, because without freedom, we can't be genuine, uh, pious believers. Thank you so much.